Uh, let's talk about the internal characteristics common to all bureaucracies. According to Downs, all bureaucracies, and many non-bureaucratic organizations as well, have the following. Formal hierarchies of authority and communication, which leverages an extensive system of formal rules to impart a formal impersonality of operations. And also the complete opposite, informal structures of authority and communications, unwritten rules and expectations, and a high degree of personal loyalty and involvement, especially at the higher ranks. These structures develop out of necessity and out of efficiency. Within large organizations, there's going to be conflicts between members or offices, not emotionally or physically, just organizationally. These conflicts can be allocational, always conflicting demands on, on resources, or those conflicts can be functional. What should be done regardless of the resource requirements? These conflicts are inherent to organizations because members have different explicit goals and because people perceive problems differently. An engineer would approach a problem differently and better than an economist. Uh, conflicts commonly exist because of organizational limits. Not everyone can know what everyone else is doing, thinking, and feeling, so there's going to be a misallocation of resources or misdirected assumptions. You can settle conflicts by voting, uh, but as Downs famously notes, democracy simply doesn't work. You would then need impartial conflict resolvers who have the authority to allocate resources or settle functional conflicts. But as a bureau grows, the number of relationships multiplies exponentially. So you'd either need an exponential increase of impartial conflict resolvers or conflict resolvers for conflict resolvers. And voila, you've got yourself a hierarchy of managers, the least resource-intensive way to coordinate efforts within an organization. To effectively resolve conflicts within a hierarchy, you need information. And that means communication. The fastest way to handle communication, theoretically, is by having a single person receive all communication and sending that to the people that need to know it. That's obviously impossible for large organizations. So you need a hierarchy of communication that balances the cost of maintaining that network and the quantity and quality of information that can be shared. This hierarchy can be different from the conflict resolving hierarchy and should be in some cases. Higher offices don't need more communication authority than lower ones and information can be passed both vertically and horizontally in a way that conflict hierarchy cannot. But there's benefits to merging the two. Uh, conflict resolvers, both functionally and resource allocation, uh, they can make more informed and more recognized decisions, and it makes it easier to formalize the communication network. Downs then discusses the form of this combined hierarchy as either flat or tall, which can result from the degree of specialization required, and thus the centralization of the coordination required. But if there's a high degree of uncertainty, flat organizations perform better because there's no wasted resources working through intermediaries of little benefit in novel situations. Uh, this tall, flat duality is discussed at length in other texts. So that's the first point. In just trying to be efficient in large, non-market organizations, we need formal hierarchies of authority and communication, often with substantial overlap, which is kind of the default for bureaucracies in 2000 current year. The second point is why they have an extensive system of formal rules. An extensive system of formal rules is seen as inherent to bureaucracies, but Downs give four reasons why they're inherent. Firstly, without the guidance of measuring output or profit, you need formal rules to provide guidance to people. Market-oriented organizations can just follow the money, but bureaucracies can't. Secondly, rules help coordinate large, complicated operations. You could train everyone to understand the entire bureaucratic operation, and then they'd understand what they should do. But for routine tasks in complicated operations, it's easier just to write out what they should do once and have members do that. 
Thirdly, it increases consistency for clients and other organizations. And lastly, you can't just let offices do or spend whatever they want because then they would do or spend whatever they want. And so the longer a bureaucracy has been doing the same routine predictable tasks, the more formalized and comprehensive the rules become. Segway. Informal structures also exist in bureaucracies. These structures exist because people are still people, even if the bureau is essentially buying members out of their self-interest with their salaries or benefits, but also to fill in the gaps of the formal structure. Not every situation can be codified in advance. Uh, some formal tasks don't get done, or shouldn't be done, or should be done, but by unassigned people. And there's tasks that need to be done outside of the formal rules. Informal structures compensate for that, and can provide members with rewards or disincentives that the rules don't account for. And so these informal structures are therefore essential to bureaus and their efficiency. But they are informal structures. They're inherently discretionary and often created by managers or employees themselves for their own goals instead of for the bureaus. And they're often very difficult for leadership to control or even influence or even account for. Another duality within bureaucracies, other than the formal, informal set of rules, is whether there is a personal versus impersonal application of procedures, especially externally, treating all clients the same, but especially internally, treating employees the same based on merit. Weber remarked that the impersonal application of rules, especially when hiring or promoting employees, was a fundamental component of bureaucracies. Weber wrote that in the early 20th century, so that would have strongly contrasted the patrimonialism that was much more prevalent in the 19th century than the 21st. But Downs proposes that that impersonality is still true internally for the lower echelons of a bureaucracy, but that the influence of personal relationships would always play a key role in higher offices. Higher offices have more influence on important policies and are often above the rules that they themselves create. And having a strong relationship with an individual is a measure of trust to manage that authority well. And the higher offices, without any higher managers to defer conflict to, uh, being able to work well with them, uh, something that's proven by having a, a long-lasting, cohesive, pre-existing relationship, that is fairly important. So, in bureaucracies, there can't be perfectly impersonal applications of procedures for employees, especially in higher offices. And that has some later implications on, on nepotism, personal loyalty, and goal congruence. Uh, these personal relationships, even at the lower levels, they also play a critical role functionally. A person can circumvent the formal relationships of their positions, like the chain of command or formal channels, to achieve their office's goals more efficiently. If a person personally knows someone in IT who can get something important done and, and they owe them a favor, it can be sorted out much faster than putting in a ticket. And on the topic of personal loyalty, uh, Downs outright contends that all high-level bureaucrats have some skeletons in the closet because of, of uh, imperfect control of subordinates, because of imperfect information, uh, because, as he states, any bureaucracy that survives has done so by taking shortcuts to increase efficiency or effectiveness, According to Downs, every high-level official has done something that would get them ousted if made public. And thus, every high-level official requires some sort of personal loyalty and discretion from their subordinates. If there isn't, every high-level official would be publicly shamed and the Bureau would lose credibility until it ceases to survive. This is a short section on this topic, but I think it deserves some attention because the implications are fairly critical. That every efficient and effective bureau survives because it's better able to instill personal loyalty despite its reputation for impersonal rules.